guys, welcome to the No State Project. I'm your host, Mark Stevens, author of Government Indicted. Glad to be with you live from the Fortified Compound in Mesa, Arizona for episode 42 of the uh, live edition, the live Wednesday edition of the No State Project, streaming live on my new my YouTube channel, No State Project. It is November 15th, 2015. Boy, I got a lot of stuff to get to. Something else over here, remember Libertopia 2018 is going to be the weekend of May 3rd through the uh, May 6th, 2018. It's going to be great. It's, uh, it's right there, uh, 2303 Shelter Island Drive in San Diego, and boy, this is one hell. Hell, if you've been there, you know this is a great, great venue. So definitely check it out. Go to Libertopia.org today and sign up for that. Um, you know, I, for whatever reason, especially during a live broadcast on YouTube here, seem to get a lot of people who are really immersed in this sovereign citizen stuff. And, and I know it's a contradiction. I, I, I get that. The sovereign movement or the Freeman on the land stuff. Uh, so it was interesting that somebody linked in the No State Project Skype chat about Jared Vogel, who is the convicted child molester, where he was the, uh, he was a spokesman for some fast food place. And, um, uh, at least the FBI got something right over here. So what he was trying to do is the, the, uh, and I'll get this in the video, Jared Vogel just tried to get out of his sex crime sentence with a legal Hail Mary. Uh, I don't know if that's really, uh, I, nah, because a Hail Mary can have merit to it, and the sovereign stuff. See, I, I'll cut off the citizens to, to make everybody happy. Uh, former Subway, I'm, I'm going to be reading directly from this, so if anyone is upset that it's sovereign citizen, take it up with the author. Former Subway pitchman Jared Fogle has tried to argue that he's a sovereign citizen, claiming a federal court that convicted him on child pornography and sexual conduct involving minors did not have the authority to do it. Fogle filed a motion on his own earlier this month in U.S. District Court in the Southern District of Indiana saying he wanted to correct an error regarding subject matter jurisdiction in the case. His defense that he is a sovereign citizen a group, of F, a group the FBI calls a domestic terrorist movement involving federal, state, and local governments, uh, believing that federal, state, and local governments operate illegally. In his motion, Fogel pointed to a friend of the court brief that was previously filed by a file, fellow inmate in the same federal prison, stating whether a judicial judgment is lawful depends on whether the sovereign has authority to render it. Fogel's argument was thrown out. If Fogel is now claiming to be sovereign, the Seventh Circuit has rejected theories of individual sovereignty, immunity from prosecution, and their ilk. U.S. District Judge Tanya Walton Pratt wrote Wednesday in her decision on the matter. Regardless of the theory, Fogel's challenge of this court's jurisdiction is rejected. Now, we know, we know that just because a, a judge rejects a challenge to jurisdiction... That, that doesn't in and of itself mean that, that the, the challenge had no merit. Here, though, it's unfortunate that you, he put forth a ridiculous claim, one that he had no evidence to support, I'm pretty sure. So it was thrown out. Fogel's not the first to attempt to use the sovereign defense in court. Earlier this year, Mark Keith Lloyd, who was accused of killing... Wow! Accused of killing his pregnant ex-girlfriend and an Orlando police officer who tried to arrest him argued that the government did not have jurisdiction to charge him. Wow. As the Post, Peter Holly reported in March, Lloyd, who is charged with first-degree murder and attempted first-degree murder, would not enter a plea at all, telling the judge, quote, y'all can't do nothing to me. Yeah, that's, that's a hell of a defense there. Uh, but the, the whole reason I'm even reading this and bringing this to anyone's attention is the FBI actually got something right. And I'm going to edit, I'm going to not say the word citizen. Sovereigns do not represent an anarchist group, nor are they a militia, although they sometimes use or buy illegal weapons. Well, use or buy an illegal weapon can apply to anybody, but uh, sovereigns or sovereign citizens do not represent an anarchist group. Because as an anarchist, we <laughs> don't accept the concept of a hierarchy or having a 
violent ruling class. We believe in rules. We don't believe in having rulers. And we don't buy this nonsense that government, which is a ruling class, is a necessary evil. It's just evil. Um, so I'm glad that they got that right. And a few times they get something right. Hopefully nobody is ever going to try to defeat a charge like that, especially when they got the goods on you by trying to claim that there's no evidence of jurisdiction and bringing the whole anarchy pers or voluntarist perspective into it. Leave us out of that. I, I have said on the show probably the last few weeks, if you're doing this Sovereign Freeman stuff, please leave my work out of it. Please, please don't mix the two. It's bad enough if you've done that and then you discover my, my work and you want to do things right and hold the prosecution to that burden of proof. It's a whole lot of thing if you know of my work and and, 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 and seen like with Ron yesterday, I posted yesterday, Ron uh, had two charges thrown out in Vegas and then try to mix the two. Please don't do this. Don't, don't, don't get my work. It, it's, it, it's enough that they try to smear me. The few people have tried to smear me and my work by lumping me in with Freeman and Sovereigns. No. We all can go back in the video I have of me being stalked by Mesa PD here in Arizona. Even though I had an anarchy flag, an anarchy symbol on my shirt, they characterized me as a sovereign citizen and a domestic terrorist, a threat to the police department. If they really thought that that was true, if you see in the video, it's a really lame attempt to, to, to follow up and, and, and go after somebody who is considered a, a, you know, a threat to the police department. Imagine that. One guy, a threat to the whole police department. I, I'm not the Terminator. So, uh, please, again, don't mix the two. What we do here on the show, and, and if you go to MarkStevens.net and my YouTube channel, you know I posted a video yesterday, and as usual, nobody's seeing, no one's, it's not getting any views because it's, it's a success story. I, I, I can't possibly get, wrap my mind around that. But if you go and you watch that or go to MarkStevens.net and you, you can see the actual document, the documentary proof, because Ron sent me a copy of, and he got a certified copy. Uh, you see that uh, there's a huge world of a difference when you simply take the claims that are being made against you and apply basic principles of logic. That being, the burden of proof is on the accuser. Instead of making claims like Jared Fogle and these sovereigns do. Oh, the name in all caps. They're just going after the corporation. Don't accept liability. Don't do it. Proof of that. I'm sure, you know, there's absolutely no proof of that whatsoever. But if someone thinks that there is, remember that the... The number here is 218-632-9399, 218-632-9399. Passcode is 2020 in the hashtag, and we'll get you up there, but uh, you got to have evidence. I don't want to hear just a long, drawn-out discourse about why, uh, you know, the, or the history. So okay, I want the actual proof that they're acting that way, that when a cop stops you, he's seeing you as in all caps, and, when, and then they write it in all caps to try to trick you. There's some huge multi-million dollar treasury account. Let that... Oy. Well, I'm not saying that everybody has lumped me in with the sovereign citizens or the sovereigns and freemans, but some people have, which is really unfortunate. It's really unfortunate that people who, even after watching the show or listening to the show, uh, will still continue going down that road and think that there's merit to those positions, which is why I said, look, if you've got the evidence to prove that the birth certificate is actually a bond and is being traded on the stock exchange, bring in the evidence. Bring it in. I would love to see it. But see, that's the difference, you know, between what I do and what the sovereigns do. And that is they're using nothing but legal interpretations and legal claims as opposed to attacking the, the, the prosecution's burden of proof. And that's why I can show many, many documents where we've had tickets thrown out. Now, like I mentioned with Ron's yesterday, we don't have enough information to know 
if the dismissal had anything to do with his defense. We don't know. It could just be the prosecution. Yeah, if someone's challenging it, you know, forget this. Without even reading it, just knowing someone's putting a defense up. Maybe that's enough in some cases that the prosecution just says, the hell with this. I'm, I am not prosecuting these, these stupid cases. That's very possible. Very possible. Of course, since it's in, it's a, in the legal realm, we want to apply the but-for but principle. But for Ron raising a defense, would they have withdrawn? Probably not. They don't have any... But it, again, we don't know if it had anything to do with the merit of the challenge. And we know that the challenge has merit. We know that. I have how many bureaucrats on record either saying they don't have to prove the foundation of their case, that the prosecution can actually argue against you without evidence. Or they'll turn around and they'll say outside of court, like Scott Bales did, I should embed that right here in this video so maybe a few more people could actually see that video. He stated that the evidence proving that the laws apply to me is the, are the, you know, is the fact that they put other people in prison. Now, the two are not meaningfully related in any way whatsoever. You don't have to be accused of a crime for them to claim that the laws apply to you. They apply to law by, uh, so-called law-abiding citizens. That's, that's, it's right in the term, law-abiding. If, if it only had to do with and applying to people who were prosecuted, oh, st- so we know that the challenge has merit, even if a judge accepts it or not. We know, because two plus two is four, whether some scumbag in a robe agrees with me or not. It doesn't matter. That's, that's, it stands on its own. So you can't go to anybody's website or YouTube channel and be able to see documentary proof that they've gotten something tossed out where you can say it had anything to do. Because if there is, it's probably nothing more than what I'm discussing right now. The fact that they put up a defense at all was enough to get this particular prosecutor to throw his hands up and say, forget this and not do it. But that is an important key here or thing to keep in mind here. Don't listen to anybody that says that you shouldn't defend yourself and you can't defend yourself because you can't win. Because I'll grant, grant it, I'll give it to you. Just throwing up a defense at all that even has merit on its face may be enough to get it tossed out. It might be. I doubt they're going to go and look at it and see Freeman sovereign stuff in there and say, oh, if, you know, let's just withdraw this. Maybe it's happened before. I don't know. I haven't seen the evidence of that. But we do know it happens. We can say, for sake of argument, with Ron's, had nothing to do with the motion to dismiss that I, I helped him with. Nothing, nothing. It had everything to do with the fact that he launched the defense at all. But there's merit to that because we should and can be defending ourselves against these criminals. And unlike what... Uh, Jared Fogel's doing, we can show that they're criminals very easily with the evidence, and that is the fact that they force us to pay them. Forcing strangers to give you money makes you a criminal. And uh, when you're organized, it's a criminal organization. So um, uh, so go to markstevens.net or my YouTube channel right here, you, No State Project, and you can see Ron's dismissal. Uh, the prosecution withdrew, so big congratulations there. I, uh, I, I've got two videos that I need to do. And, and one of them has to do with the IRS. And so I, just briefly, um, because if, if you're new to the channel, great. Uh, glad to have you aboard. Uh, we, uh, we, when we defend ourselves against these challenges, you do it as a, heart, as a skeptic. Uh, we do it you know, primarily, and that means you know, we're taking it from an anarchist viewpoint that uh, when you force strangers to give you money, you're a criminal. And that because those called government do force people, everyone to give them money, they're a criminal organization. Because of that, that those are facts that they force everyone to pay. That, that is an irrefutable fact. And it's not like critics will turn around and say, you know, no, that, that is a fact. And as you'll see in the video, and I've had another video similar to this a number of years ago, the IRS does consider the claim that the tax laws are, or, the, or compliance with the tax laws is voluntary. They consider that to be a frivolous argument, okay? 
because uh, it's not. It is compulsory. You do it or you go to jail. They are forcing you. And it's because of those facts, and we, we those facts are very important. So when you get a traffic ticket, you want to keep that in mind. They're trying to claim that, that the court is a fair, impartial, independent decision maker. Really? Really? How does that square with the facts? They're forcing everyone. And then here, in, in an acute sense, they are forcing you to answer the prosecutor's claim. How is that fair and impartial? They're, they're actually acting on behalf of the prosecution. How else, well, 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 how, how else are they going to hold you to answer the prosecutor's claim? They're still forcing you. So uh, is he a fair, impartial, independent decision maker? No. We are using these, the Socratic method, just asking questions to bring out these contradictions, that they are not uh, uh, protectors of life, liberty, and property, but they are actually a criminal enterprise. They are a criminal organization. Okay? And that's what we go through in the motion to dismiss, to bring that out, that there is no actual evidence that their constitution and codes apply. This isn't a matter of legal interpretation. This is not, I'm quoting some court case. I'm not going, and I actually have a Black's Law Dictionary behind me. I'm not quoting their code or their laws to them. So like when I was talking with, these, with this IRS agent, and I'll talk a bit about more in depth about uh, what may be a call of shame, which should be a call of shame, uh, dealing with taxes. And it doesn't matter that it's taxes. You're going to go through the same challenges in a traffic ticket or a drug charge or a uh, possession or even if it, you know, uh, any code violation. So what I was able to get them to do was be specific about the uh, reasons why the collection due process hearing, and yes, hearing with the air quotes, why it was denied. And I've mentioned this before, and I'll have this all in the video. They confirmed two agents, and yes, I'm talking about Nicole L. Mullen and Jennifer Zipnick, and they work out of the Holtzville office there in Long Island. They confirmed that it was a spe specified frivolous position. They don't even use the word argument anymore. Frivolous position. Now, again, if someone is making a claim that has no evidentiary basis, zero, they're just, they're just making it up, it, that's frivolous. Just like what Jared Vogel did. They have no problem saying that, well, the argument that you're not a taxpayer, what then meaning a statute is frivolous. They have no problem calling you or I out for a frivolous argument. But they don't want that same attention put on theirs. You even ask them. Now, they knew where I was going, so with this recent call, I was not able to get what I wanted. They wound up hanging up the phone with me. When you're asking them about frivolous, when they're saying it's a frivolous argument, you got, look, can you please articulate to me exactly what the hell you mean by the word frivolous? What does the court mean by frivolous? What do you mean by frivolous? And, you know, all day the same thing. They don't want to answer that because they don't know. All they know is they have this list, which, as I'll show in the video, we can prove it's a false statement that they made and is mail fraud because they're trying to take your money from you. They're lying to get your money. That's mail fraud. So um, what I get them, what, I, what I'm trying to pin them down on, and I think this is very important for us to do, is if I am making an argument that has no factual basis to it. It's not that it doesn't have that it has facts that may or may not be true. If I make an argument against the IRS that has no evidence to support it, would that be frivolous? Now, anybody who's familiar and spent any time dealing with me knows exactly why I'm asking that question because I'm going to turn it around on them. Well, doesn't the history that we've presented so far with the IRS at least raise it a very strong presumption? that the IRS's claim of jurisdiction has no evidence or no facts to support? Wouldn't that be a frivolous argument? So if there's a frivolous argument being used here, it's not by me, it's by you. So by their own definition, their argument is frivolous. They were familiar enough with me that they saw that coming. 
But oh, did I get an admission from a tax assessor this week? Oy vey, this this is one for the books. I I I haven't heard this one in a while. But uh, I want to get to a call. So uh, after the calls, I will discuss this fantastic admission from a very a, a seasoned ta- a tax assessor. The guy's job is to assess taxes <laughs> for a county. Uh, you know, local criminal organization of the state, the, you know, the county. And he made this unbelievably great admission or statement that I don't get that often. And it, it's it's good. So we got area code 951. You're live on the No State Project now. What's your name? Where are you calling from? All right, we're going to try this again. I, it looks like it's Riverside, California that we have. That's we'll- Sky. Yeah, welcome. Uh, I can hear you. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Yeah, there I got it. Okay, hi, I'm Robin. Okay, Robin. How's it going, Mark? Uh, you um, calling from California? You. Yep, that's me. Yeah, the, un- the, the unlawful state here. Hi, I'm getting uh, to know all this uh, legal gem- uh, legalese. And what happened here is I've got a suspended license, and I've been I've gotten like four tickets already. And I was going, uh, I exited off the freeway and I was forced to go on to a Navy base or an Army, a military base because it was like right there. And they asked me for a driver's license. I gave them my California ID and they told me to pull over and then they impounded my car and made me walk in the dark somewhere. And I'm a 57 year old woman. But that, um, with that said, it was then referred to federal court. And that's because it was federal property. So with that said, I um, I called the courts because I didn't receive a notice to appear. And this is odd. I've never had this happen. Are you there? Well, did you get a ticket? Yes, I did for driving on a spend. Was there car. was there a date on the ticket for you to appear? No, it said they would send me a notice. So then if you don't get a notice in 45 days, it's called the Central Bureau of something with federal court. So then I called and the tape set up my court date was the next day. Well, I'm disabled and, I, and it's like I wasn't going down there. So I called the, the Central Bureau of, I forget the name, I don't know the ticket in front of me. And so they gave me the number to the federal court in San Diego. I called the lady, told her I'm disabled. She says, well, I, she goes, did you get your license? No. I said, I have a right to travel. She said, oh. well, send in. Yeah, so I sent, she goes, uh, email me your um, affidavit to the judge. So I gave the affidavit I've learned from you. Um, I found one was uh, uh, no jurisdiction and no uh, no uh, uh, victim, what do you call it? Yeah. So I Robin, that in. Robin. Yeah, yeah. At which point in time did you find my show and the work that I do is you know it, uh, last week and that's what I scheduled to hear you <sighs> yeah let's so. let, let me just take a moment again yeah. to let everybody know there's not a shred of validity not one mm-hmm. it this right to travel stuff that sovereigns and freemans and whatnot do there is no merit to it whatsoever and please okay. for heaven please I know that you weren't aware at the time but we owe it to our friends and family, anyone we may know that's involved with this stuff. There is no merit, period. Uh, th- th- we got to stop. You, you got to. OK, so did you actually send in what, some kind of affidavit? Yeah. Oh. Have, uh, like, in a case that was a uh, uh, lack of jurisdiction and no subject matter. Do you know what the purpose of an affidavit is? Uh, to prove that uh, I'm not uh, legal, legally con- connected with them? You know, you tell me, Mark. So you filed an affidavit not knowing what the purpose of an affidavit is? Well, it was to, to, to prove the jurisdiction that they had no jurisdiction over the, the, uh, the situation. And the subject matter is I know that there has to be a victim to have a crime. An yeah. affidavit is a statement under oath of facts and information. Yeah. Currently right. within your, you know, that you have personal knowledge of. So then that was an affidavit. It was, uh, then it, I, had, I don't know the legal term. Well, if you're going to make legal arguments, if you're going to make a legal challenge, you don't do it by way of affidavit. You do it by way of a motion. Okay, uh, so that's what it was called? Well, that's what it should have been called, and it, okay. but you, you still didn't present anything of any of any substance to show that they did not have jurisdiction. I mean, if it, because their claim of jurisdiction, territorial jurisdiction, it's in the name. 
right. you're physically on their pro on property, you know, a certain territory or, or geographic area, here it was the Navy base, they consider that, hey, you're here on our property, we got the goods on you. Um, right. And so... So they automatically had the goods on me. Well, I didn't enter it yet. They told me to enter it and then go park in the on the outside uh, of it and wait for them. Were you for? Did they? Did they? Did they command you to do that? Were you? Did you? Were you under the impression that if you didn't do this, they would? They would? You know, they would go through the force continuum and, and they would make you stop. Yes, because yes, the military guy was the one that said he called. He called up the federal police cop. Then the cop came over and the guys came with guns and they all stood there trying to open my door and I wasn't opening it, but then it, the lock, I didn't set the lock right. And um, they opened it and told me to get out and handcuff me. Okay, so you were but forced to do it. All right. So their claim of jurisdiction, I don't think, holds any water because you were forced to, to, to do that. But that's a completely right. different defense than putting in an affidavit of that uh, of your status and whatnot and that you have any, you probably put legal arguments in there that you have a right to travel right no I, I put in the ar argument of they don't have jurisdiction and no subject matter of a case because all right so what did you all right so in the affidavit you were doing similar to what I've done what I do in the motion to dismiss in that you're raising the the uh, challenge to the sufficiency of the complaint that to be a valid Cause of action requires loss, harm, and injury. It requires the right. the, the viol yeah. So yeah, no business whatsoever being an affidavit. It's 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 in the okay. wrong. It's, so it's the wrong word. Well, you don't do it as an affidavit, and so they're very very familiar with how sovereigns and freemen do things. That they seem to think that affidavits are the highest form of of law, or the and and, and a, an unrebutted affidavit stands as truth in law and commerce. So, you know. Right. Um, Okay, so if you put in there that Santa Claus will visit every child, you know, who, you know, on December 25th, and nobody comes steps forth to rebut it, does that make it true? Right. Uh, did, did, no. All right, so where, where does it stand right now? Is there a warrant for your arrest? No. So with that said, okay, so the, the clerk there at the federal court said, okay, because I'm disabled, um, and my court date was the next day. She said, just mail in your proof of something. So I did. So I emailed her, correct? And then she said, uh, the judge will review it on November 1st. And I said, uh, then what? And I don't have to be there, but on the, on the uh, recording, it said I had to be there. She said, I didn't have to be there. And so now I tried, this is odd, I tried to call the federal number back. And some weird computer court recording comes on and it's stating we've served 96 billion people and since da, 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 and I can't get through. And then yesterday I get an email from the Central Bureau of, I don't have the paper out work on me, that they, she stated that I owe $300 for the assessment and the judge is still reviewing my case. So they've already, already levied a fine. Yeah, and, and it, but it says the judge is still reviewing my case, but you have to pay uh, some kind of assessment. I can look at my email. Of $300. Yeah, I, I, I would, um, you know what, everyone familiar, know, I would I would file a motion to dismiss that, you know, and bring out that they, they forced you onto the property. And uh, okay. other than forcing you on the property, they don't have a shred of evidence to prove jurisdiction. But you've got to stick to just challenging the factual basis of their claims and not make any other legal conclusions. Uh, you know, the reason why they don't have subject matter jurisdiction and personum jurisdiction is because there's no evidence to support that. Uh, they may lie and say that jurisdiction is a pure issue of law. It doesn't require any evidence. Uh, but your physical right. location is what they're using. To show territorial jurisdiction. Again, territorial jurisdiction. It's in the name. <laughs> Correct. That's I not directed you. towards you, yep. by the way. But yeah, uh, I got you. <laughs> that's what kills me. It's in the name. And they'll turn around and say, jurisdiction's got nothing to do with any kind of evidence. Run, run. Yeah, sure. Well, that's I would put that in. I would put that in as soon as possible. And, and again, it is limited to just facts. They don't have subject matter jurisdiction because there's no evidence to support their claim that their code applies to you and you violated it. Mm -hmm. Now, with that said, that's what I, I had sent in. And then here is the email um, that I received back. It says, your email on 1110 was received. Currently, there is an outstanding $300 abstract fine assessed on your citation. The correspondence provided by you after your court date is under consideration. 
Now it's saying the correspondent provided by you after your court date is under consideration. So well, the, it, apparently it they, asked, they like, apparently they they had a trial in absentia. You know, wasn't considered. Right. Yeah. And so they're yeah, saying it's not that, considered that, that criminal. They didn't do it. Yeah, yeah, so you've got a default against you. So uh, the motion, I, yeah, again, I would do the motion to dismiss because jurisdiction could be challenged at any time, and that's what I would right, do. Right. Uh, I and I would not pay. I wouldn't pay them a damn thing. Exactly. So again, I did send in the the, the jurisdiction and the subject matter, but apparently this um is called it's a, it's a CVB and it doesn't give the name uh, Central something, but they 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 didn't realize that I spoke to the clerk at federal court itself. There's two different entities. This this is the place you call to get all the information. Oh, it's Central Violations Bureau in Philadelphia. So she didn't realize that I spoke to the clerk in federal court and that I didn't have to appear. So they're, they're more or less giving me a $300 extract because it says the correspondent provided by you after the court date. You see what I'm saying? So well, again, they, they you've got it, but you, you have to have in your motion to dismiss. You need to include in there that you were not given uh, notice. Yeah, and exactly. Okay. Do, that's, a, that's a due process, a basic fundamental due process violation because due process at a bare minimum requires notice and opportunity to defend. So that's right. what I would do. And, and the thing was, yeah, and the thing was they, sent, they said they sent me a notice. And um, luckily I have a P.O. box at a uh, crisis house and I have proof I never got the notice. So I was working on that one. And also then um, now the biggest thing is since I got four others and the biggest thing is I am on felony probation, felony probation. So now, according to their law, I violated it, but they haven't found out yet. They're going to. Yeah, because I reported it when I went in and nothing was said. Wow. Well, you know, the best I can do right now, given the time constraints, is is to do you know what what we already discussed, and right. and and uh, get that information, get that motion into them as soon as you can, because that that's a no brainer, and and take it from there. You know, it's just I'm okay. I'm, starting, I'm getting lined up with calls, and we're almost out of time, so that's the okay, best okay. I can do right now. Real quick, I did send in, I did send in. That's what it, I sent in. It was a motion to dismiss. Um, that it wasn't a, an affidavit, so that's what I did. I did that already, and that's what the judge is doing right now, reviewing. Did you so include? The, um, did you include yeah. in there that you did not get a notice and opportunity notice. to? Defend? No, yeah, I didn't notice that. No. Yeah, you okay, then supplement Mark. it. Put that in. Yeah, file as okay, a supplement. Okay, thank you so much, honey. Uh, you're welcome. Okay. Appreciate the call, and, and let me know how, what happens. We got Robin, okay, thank in, you. Robin in California. Wow, what a mess! And and felony probation. Uh, yeah, that really sucks. Now you got to challenge the foundation, the jurisdiction of the of the felony complaint. I right, but and we'll get to it, the calls in a second. I can't stress this enough. Do not file affidavits. Ninety eight percent of the time. All we have to do is point out that the prosecution has no evidence. It doesn't require any evidence from us. Now, again, if you've been beaten by the police, if they threaten you, if you got, you know, video, if you got witnesses to that, that's a different story. But that is not a part of most of what we do here. Thank goodness. You have no business taking a burden of proof upon yourself. This is why we talk about basic principles of logic. If you do not have to take a burden of proof on yourself, don't. If you can if you know that the prosecution has no evidence against you, don't assume that they have the evidence. Don't do their job for them. If they don't have the proof, it's not in the record, you don't have any business filing an affidavit. An affidavit stands as truth in commerce. Oh, give me a break. I love the 90s as much as anybody. I do. Some of the best music. Nine Inch Nails, you know... Uh, but these legal things that came out in the 90s, they don't have any merit. You got to drop it. Stick to logic. Stick to reason. Hold the accuser to their burden. I had spoken. I wanted to talk about the IRS assessor. Maybe I'll take a couple minutes to, to get into that because I'm almost... Ho holy crap. Uh, we've got somebody here. I know you're calling from Long Island. What's your name? And what part of the island are you calling from? Hello. You can hear me? Uh, I can hear you. What part of Long Island are you calling oh. from? Well, actually, I'm in Georgia. Um, just okay. super phone number, <laughs> but my name is Marie. Marie, okay, Marie. And I'm gonna kind of just cut to the chase because it's been going on for the better part of a year, and I'm pretty certain that I've either run out of time or what to expect here. Um, 
So at this point, I'm just kind of wondering what I can do since I know I'm kind of late in the game or what I could do afterwards. Um, I was charged with driving with a suspended license and well, I was charged with it twice, which happened in a matter of a couple of months based off of a fix it ticket in another County. So I got charged in Walton County and Monroe city for the suspended license because I was receiving notification from the driver's department services that my license wouldn't be suspended until the end of the month or a couple of months after I was actually um, given the ticket for it. So I had assumed that it wasn't, but because of a fix it ticket that I had kind of forgotten about, it was already suspended. So mind you, I already went through handling the fix it ticket, which they threw that out. I ended up doing 18 days of a 40 day sentence for the suspended ticket in Walton County. Um, but I was placed on probation for Monroe City for the suspended license. Um, at this point, I ha haven't been able to actually do anything for the probation. So while I was incarcerated, I was petitioned with a uh, revocation and modification of probation, which I have a hearing for on the 17th. Um, of course, it's saying that I, I failed to report and do any of those things, but of course I couldn't because I was in their jail. Um, yeah. So at this point, I'm a little uncertain as to what to do. I The only reason I agreed to the probation in the first place was because I was nursing a seven-week-old child at the time, and both the solicitor and the judge acknowledged that we understand that you have a seven-week-old baby that you're trying to get home to because I made great complaints about it while I was in jail for 11 days um, before the probation. And so they're like, you can get released today, you know, if you do the probation. Well, of course, I didn't, in my mind, I don't really have a choice. I need to get home to my baby or I spend more time in jail and he's a nursing child. So I agreed to it. And now they're bringing it back for modification because I spoke to the probation officer, letting them know that I can't do any of this. Because of the results of me having my suspended license, I can't work. Um, I ended up having to leave my apartment. I wasn't able to stop an eviction because I couldn't put in an answer to the notice. Um, I can't travel now. I'm like an hour away from where they are now. And now I'm kind of wondering before my hearing if that dis um, motion to dismiss, which I was getting ready to get, if that would even be pertinent at this point, if it would even be useful. Well, there's not even if you get it tossed out, you you might not be able to get the suspension lifted. You'd have to go through a hearing right. with, the, with the DMV. So even if you can show that the ticket had no merit, is the DMV going to give a damn? You know, it's like you're arguing. You you can get it tossed out by showing the prosecution has no evidence of jurisdiction, but the DMV is going to be like, why do you want the license if there's no evidence and it applies? So I'm. I don't know if they, they, but you still have to deal with that. So you got two separate issues here. Unless you can get it tossed out and have the judge order the DMV to re, you know, to un, you know, unsuspend the license, which is possible. So I would, I would file the motion to dismiss, and I'd fight it as hard as I could. I, 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 okay. it, it's sickening that they, they, they would take somebody in a nonviolent situation like this. Where you're not accused of, you know, of killing somebody or doing real harm, and that they would separate a mother from a nursing child, that is monstrous. You you can't think of too many things in this world short of murder and rape that 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 rise to the level of of just cruelty, as separating a nursing baby from its mother that is just this that is more evidence of just the type of people that we're dealing with here they are not just criminals they're cruel right it, right it, and beyond cruel cool for the simple fact that they had been arresting me since i was pregnant i mean they took me in geez. at eight months i had refused to be booked um, and I ended up staying in the holding cell for hours before they finally came and said, look, you don't have to pay anything. We'll let you go. Um, if you let us book you on your own recognizance. And so of course I agreed to that because of the situation. Um, but yeah, I have no history of violent crime. I have no history of drug use, drug possession, nothing. I'm a mother of three. I, I haven't hurt, harmed anyone or anyone's property whatsoever. And yeah, I feel like a criminal or even being 
jailed with actual criminals. Well, sure. I, yeah, I, th- that that is horrible. I don't have much time, we, uh, and so I'm not going to be able to get to everybody. And I really, uh, maybe I'll take a few moments to talk about the uh, the tax case. But the the best I can do at this point is file the motion to dismiss and okay. try to. What you can do is you can fi- you know, and I can help with this. Try to get it heard uh, telephonically and let them know you ha- it's your fault that I cannot travel there. Okay. You guys okay. did so this. I can call them tomorrow then, right, and do that. Well, you you well, I would file the motion to dismiss and try to, and try to get it telephonically. Yes, you can tell them like you okay. can call and try to do it that way. They may want you to file a formal motion, but yet you can give it a shot and call down there and say, "Hey, you guys have made me so made it so I can't travel. So I need to do this. I need to get a motion to dismiss in, and I'd like to get it done, uh, heard telephonically." Okay. And any okay, hearing okay. that they may set against you should be done telephonically. Okay. All right. Perfect. Well, thank you. Um, I really appreciate it. At least that gives me um, an opportunity to figure out what I can do here. It gives me something to do rather than nothing at all. Yeah, I wish I had more right now, but, but, you know, you can contact me off air and then you can also call again on the Saturday show when we have more time. But I, I'm just, I'm out of time and I don't have the option of, of really going over much today. Sure. I'll call in actually Saturday and let you know how it went. All right. Oh, yeah. I appreciate that. Uh, I, yeah, thank you. I appreciate the call. Uh, I think it's absolutely disgraceful for, and what I would, what I would recommend doing for Marie and anyone else in a situation like this, which I hope nobody has to go through this. That is disgusting. That is so, that is such an intrusion on a family that, uh, I, I think only you know only a, a, you know a, a sexual molestation or a, some kind of sexual crime would, would would be worse. To actually separate a newborn baby from its mother uh, is disgraceful. There's no reason for that. And and when you add into the fact that she was not accused of a crime, she was not accused of hurting anybody. To separate them, that they are so cruel and such control freaks that they have to do something so extreme i i i i, I oh fungal i i it's it just just it, it it's beyond the pale it's absolutely disgusting and i would certainly encourage anybody to file an insurance claim against the county or the city for the judge against the judge and the prosecutor who did this that thought it was so necessary to prosecute somebody that you can't even take into consideration. What if they had Alzheimer's? What if they were, they were terminal? You're going to put, take somebody with cancer and you're going to not allow somebody with cancer to go through their treatment, whatever your view of that is irrelevant? Why not take someone on hospice who's terminal? Lock them up. Hey, our laws, benevolent protectors of life, liberty, and property, ah, fungal you are. The cruelty here. People think that what happened to Nurse Wubbles was bad? No. The cop was dead wrong. He kidnapped her. But separating a mother from her child, disgusting, deplorable, absolutely sickening. But uh, just briefly, because we're totally out of time here, I had a tax assessor. I finally got back with him. He did not call me back uh, for almost a week, so I called back, and then he called back. He was the one that said that when I asked for it, now he confirmed that if the property's physically in California, then the Constitution applies. They have jurisdiction to do an assessment. The problem came in when I asked for actual proof of that, and he said that that had stumped him. And I'll have to do this in another video, but I kept on feeding. This is why I said you write things down. I kept on feeding his words back to him. I kept, I just wanted, so he comes back, and after a week, the best he can do is read me a diatribe about Proposition uh, 13 from 1978. So I let him go through all that. And he says about the challenge, and, and Prop 13 has been challenged, and it is constitutional. I said, did I make a constitutional challenge? 
Didn't I just ask you to support your claim that your constitution applies because the property is physically in California? Didn't I just ask you to prove that? So that's not a constitutional challenge. So I again ask him for the evidence. And he says, I don't know how to answer. But the big one was when I kept on pressing him for an answer, and it was, it was nice, it was professional, he realized he's not going to be able to answer the question by just repeating his claim or reading something about Proposition 13 from 1978. He knows that I'm only going to accept facts. So when I ask you for facts or I ask you for evidence, that's all I'm going to accept. If you say A equals B, give me the proof that A equals B. Don't just keep saying A equals B. So he knows I'm not going to accept that, and that's when he said, I'd rather not answer without counsel present. He'd rather not answer without his county counsel with him. And yet, knowing he cannot prove his claim, still thinks he's acting in good faith. And why? Because he doesn't think that all those other people that have been assessed were done improperly. He still thinks that even though he cannot support his claim, that going forward anyway, he still thinks it's good faith. Ay, yeah, yeah. So I would have liked to have had more time, but hey, the show is to help people, so that's what, what hopefully we're able to do. Uh, I'll get this up on markstevens.net, my YouTube channel, as soon as I can. The audio will be up today, though. Again, this has been episode 42 of the live edition of the No State Project here, streaming live on uh, my YouTube channel. I will be live on Saturday, so till then, as always, salud.